Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome to the ACO mentorship uh, year round uh, mentorship uh, session. Uh, today's um, uh, talk about surviving grad school. Uh, today's discussion topic is about surviving grad school. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing myself. I'm uh, Vinod Kumar Prabhakaran. I'm a senior research scientist at Google working on issues around ethics and fairness. Uh, my background is in NLP, but I work at the intersection of NLP and society, um, and mostly. Uh, using NLP for social science questions, but also looking at how social disparities get um, reflected or amplified through potential uh, machine learning and NLP technologies, potentially. Um, that's a brief intro. Uh, I will, uh, and today we have as panelists um, Verna Rieser, who is a professor at the School of, um, at, at the um, Harry Watt University in Edinburgh. Uh, John Hewitt, he's a PhD student at Stanford. Uh, Greg Contruck, uh, sorry if I pronounce, mispronounce the name, uh, a professor at um, University of Alberta, uh, and Stephen Wilson, assistant professor at uh, Auckland University. Um, so the way we uh, do this um, session in, in, uh, usually is we start with a brief sort of like maybe a five minute sort of um, response from each of you uh, panelists to the general topic about like, uh, you know, um, how to survive grad school. Uh, and we have like a panelist uh, from different uh, sort of um, uh, stages in the career. So that's an interesting sort of perspective. Uh, I hope that like the pan uh, the uh, participants who are logging, uh, tuning into this and are also watching later would definitely benefit from hearing from such a sort of um, a wide range of uh, experiences. Um, so I'll start with um, uh, John. Is that okay? Absolutely. <clears throat> um, uh, yeah. So, do you want to um, basically respond to like the the general topic, like you know your experience uh, currently as a grad student, but also sort of like you know what you have felt like works and does not work, and um, how you have sort of or you currently uh, what kind of strategies you have in sort of navigating these issues. Certainly. What are issues? Yes, so um, hello everyone. Uh, I am a fourth year PhD, uh, which I guess means that, you know, I've made it hopefully most of the way. I'm really banking on the idea that this is <clears throat> most of the way through. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been, I think a very difficult, uh, but also very good uh, four years. Um, and uh, yeah, I was really intrigued, I guess, by the topic of, of surviving grad school, because there's, uh, there's a premise there, right? That there is something to be survived, uh, that it is, you know, a, a challenging and difficult time. And I have definitely um, felt that. Uh, I think that um, there's considerable stress and what I think I'll be talking about um, has the sort of perspective that I feel most um, capable of bringing this kind of problem of, of you know, gosh, okay, so you're, you're doing your PhD now and um, you've, you, you want to make the most of it and, and, and you want to, to seize the opportunity that, you, that you've gotten and yet you're tired and you're sort of working all the time and, 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 and that can be a struggle if that's how you choose to to do your PhD. So here's, here's what I've, here's what I've felt. I've felt um, a considerable amount of competition among PhDs. I think at Stanford, um, you know, I feel like my fellow kind of cohort mates are my friends and we're not like directly like, ah, oh, in competition, but you see tons of students all around the world doing amazing work. And you're like, oh gosh, you know, this is a lot. There's a lot to keep up with and everyone's publishing so quickly. And, you know, should I be working more? And uh, um, one thing that gets talked a lot about is work-life balance. Um, and I've at various times felt like, oh, I feel bad for not working enough. And then other times I feel bad for working too much. Like, oh, I should be focusing more on work-life balance. And so my opening statement is sort of um, that, you know, there's a broad range of amounts of work that get you through a PhD, as far as I can tell. Okay, no proof here. I haven't graduated yet. Um, but there's no one right amount to work and you shouldn't guilt yourself over working too much or too little. Um, uh, likely you're in the right range and you know this you can enjoy working a lot for a while and then work less later and it doesn't need to be uniform either and so 
uh, taking your own temperature as to whether you're sort of doing okay and, and working more or less with respect to that is healthy and you don't need to sort of abide by some global standard of make sure you only work a nine to five PhD or make sure you're working all the time or something like that because I don't think there's one right answer. Okay, that's a long talk. I'll let someone else talk. <laughs> No, thank you. I mean, we'll come back to you, but uh, yeah, uh, we can uh, move on to uh, um, maybe uh, Steve, uh, do you want to go next? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, and really um, what John said, I think is spot on about finding the amount of work that feels right for you. And I feel like that was kind of a revelation I had at some point during my PhD um, that really took a lot of burden off of me to realize, you know, I'm going to do the amount of work that feels right to me and that I think is appropriate. And if people say that's not enough, then maybe I don't really want to be here. Um, you know, and I'm going to do that. And it did work out and no one ever told me I wasn't working enough, but kind of starting to set those boundaries, making that clear and knowing for yourself what time you plan to spend for different activities that you have and making sure that you leave time um, for yourself and to take care of yourself and things like that. Um, balancing a lot of different things, uh, which I think is one of the big struggles. I mean, it, PhD is hard for technical reasons, but um, also just because you have to uh, deal with so many things and you're balancing all of these uh, different demands at the same time. So yeah, I think setting boundaries is really important. Choosing what you say yes to um, and thinking of the implicit no's you're saying to other things when you agree to take on a, a new project or a new collaboration or things like that because you you can't do everything as much as you probably want to because there's so many uh, really fun and exciting things to do during your PhD. Um, and then I think another big one is to enjoy the PhD um, and I don't recommend going in with the mindset of you're going to spend five plus years uh, just at the grindstone, but it'll be worth it in the end, but um, I won't enjoy while I'm doing it. I think uh, not every day will be super fun and thrilling uh, necessarily, but uh, hopefully more often than not, you're excited to get up and work on really super interesting research projects and the things that you're most curious about, you get to go study every day, I think is really cool. Um, and having something like that, like having an experience you enjoy will keep your motivation high, uh, which is super important, like maintaining motivation to continue to work on what you're doing. So really, I, I know there are a lot of rewards at the end, but also I think doing a PhD itself should be intrinsically rewarding. Um, and so if you, I guess if you go for a long period of time and you're not feeling that, then that's also something to consider, like what changes can you make to see what um, what do you really want to get out of it and um, keeping good communication with your advisor about setting those kinds of expectations. I'll stop there for now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, that is uh, uh, really uh, great. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm resonating with a lot of what both uh, John and Steve said, but I'll wait until like later. Verena, do you want to go next? Uh, uh, your thoughts on uh, the topic? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so I, I fully agree with, you know, a lot of the points which uh, were already mentioned. Um, so my PhD was um, some time ago now. So I'm a professor now. And my PhD was about 14 years ago. <laughs> but in the meantime, I've uh, had the privilege to um, supervise and advise, you know, a couple of PhD students. So I had about um, 10 years of experience in, in supervising students. So I've, uh, um, you know, um, walked along the way with them and um, were able to advise them and um, so I've had about 10 PhD students um, and eight of which I supervised to completion and two of them are dropping out and I mentioned that because I think dropping out is not a disaster and that's also something we you know need to remember that um, dropping out of grad school is sometimes the right decision and I think just having this knowledge is something which can alleviate the pressure a bit. Um, I also I did my um, postgraduate studies in Germany and the UK, which I think is a slightly different experience from 
what you call grad school in um, in the US, for example. So um, maybe my view is um, slightly different from you know what what you would usually call grad school. Um, and um, just talking for myself, um, I have to say grad school wasn't easy for me from what I can remember, but these were also different times. So when I, um, when I did my PhD, there wasn't such a big pressure to publish. And I observed that this changed dramatically over the last couple of years. You know, you're almost expected to, um, you know, submit or publish a paper at almost every, every year at a big conference. And these, these conferences have gotten much, much more competitive. Um, so there is a much higher chance that, you know, you get a paper rejected um, from what it used to be. And I think that has a big impact on the mental health of the students and the pressure they put themselves on and the amount of work they think they need to put into um, just the, this high competitiveness, um, as I was already mentioned, I think that really drastically changed over the last um, 14 years. And I think that's something we need to or should should address as a community because it's not it's not necessarily resulting in better, better papers, and it's certainly not resulting in in a better uh, mental health of the students. And partly, what the students need to unfortunately learn is quite a have high level of resilience, of resilience to rejections of their papers. And it doesn't mean the paper was bad; it just means you know you you were unlucky. It often means you were unlucky with reviewers. Um, uh, so, so I think you know the 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 experience is just a much more stressful one that um, you know from the from the good old days. And so, yeah, I think that's that's something where PhD students need to be just much more aware and proactive about their stress levels and their um, their mental health and. I rarely saw a student who worked too little. I often see students who work too much, which basically means they're not productive anymore. Um, and, and, and people have already mentioned that, you know, there's even the pressure that you're you're taking, you're having a good work-life balance. Um, usually I see that skewed towards too much work. And I, I, I do think having, you know, certain boundaries of even a, a five to, you know, a nine to five job is actually quite healthy because you need that time to recuperate and to, you know, fill your energy levels again and fill your batteries. Um, so, so, so doing a PhD is not a sprint. To, doing a PhD is a marathon. If you treat it as a sprint to the next paper, you're doing something wrong. Um, so, so that's my, my brief <laughs> introduction. Thanks, Verena. Uh, now, uh, Greg, uh, uh, can you share your thoughts on uh, the topic? Sure, yeah, uh, a lot already has been said about it. Uh, I think uh, Steve made a good point that, uh, you know, you need to, and also uh, uh, Verena said that not to work too much because actually the productivity is not a simple correlation with the time you put into and uh, also that try to enjoy your PhD because from my perspective, you know, I did PhD uh, uh, and then uh, I became a faculty member and it actually is uh, very different in terms that as a as a professor, you need to do a lot of other things like uh, administration and teaching, especially so you can you, you don't have the luxury to devote all your time to research, which is what you can do as a PhD. So so this is something to I think the, to enjoy. And uh, also uh, it's very intimidating sometimes to look at the papers uh, that are published and thinking well how how am I supposed to produce something like that? Uh, it's important to to basically focus on on what you're doing on your topic and try to do a good job and and uh, do uh, follow you know follow what your supervisor uh, kind of advice they give you and not to try to set the bar too high. I I often tell the students that there is no actually actual requirement 
how many top conference papers you have to publish. Uh, what is there required is a, is a dissertation that makes sense. And that's something that is more in control, that you, you're in control of, that you can produce regardless of the reviews and decisions of other people uh, that are usually anonymous. And uh, and it's it's true that, that it hurts, right? It's, it always hurts to to get reviews of your paper that you put a lot of work into and see that people didn't really understand what you're trying to do. So, um, yeah, I think that the solution is to focus on doing your best and doing your job and uh, that will be enough. Thanks, thanks, Greg. Uh, all great points. Uh, I'll, I don't really have a lot more to add here, but I will share my personal experience uh, as well uh, before we sort of like, you know, launch into like the questions that we are a lot of really interesting questions coming through. So I don't want to take up too much space and time. So, I mean, from my experience, I have, to, I, I mean, I have a, I've been very fortunate. I think I had a very um, enjoyable PhD experience, if I remember correctly. So I'm like, I, but I know that that's not the norm. Um, I think I was very lucky with like having a great advisor, but also being in a great city. Like I was in the New York City. So I always had this sort of like easy out when things get like really stressful. I just like go out or whatever. And there was a lot more social. I think what one thing that I did was there was a lot of mixing of social life. And I mean, I had a pretty active social life that was kind of kept me grounded and like not like feeling kind of like miserable or anything uh, that I have often heard people talk about. Um, I also love travel. So I, uh, I, for me, like travel was like the main motivation for like research. Like I'm like, oh, there is this conference in this city. And like, so I did a lot of research, like, you know, uh, centered around travel. So there's all these things that I remember very um, fondly of my time uh, at PhD. But I think most of the things that I've brought up here, I've experienced them like at different times in my career, right? Like I've experienced super, I mean, and some of them was because of like this kind of mixing social and career uh, kind of life was that I didn't really have a good work-life balance. It didn't matter when I was at grad school, I was relatively single, relatively single. Um, uh, uh, so, sorry, that was or face phrasing. Uh, I meant like single for most of the time. Um, I, what I what happened was that it was just like always like I was taking work everywhere. I was like uh, going to like trips with like friends. I'll take my work laptop and I'll try to like, you know, read a paper here or there. And that worked back then. But I don't think like it. it and it's very hard to shake that off. Uh, so that's something like while you survive grad school, I think you you, you also want to survive it as like a functioning social, uh, you know, uh, human being. Like, so I think I'm still like uh, seven years later, I'm still kind of shaking it off. Like, you know, I still kind of take work things on my vacation. I once had like a flight uh, attendant, like take my laptop away because it was going to a <laughs> destination. And she was like, no, you're not working now. She just like took the laptop away. So I think it, it, it is like a, a, a thing to hard to shake it off. Another thing that I have faced, like not necessarily during my grad school is like imposter syndrome is something that I've heard like a lot of um, uh, uh, students face. And that's something like um, uh, it's hard to deal with depending on where you end up in. Uh, and um, I think it's just knowing that everyone goes through that is probably a good thing. Like when I shared that with my postdoc advisor, uh, which is Dan Jurovsky, he was like, oh yeah, I had imposter syndrome uh, when I joined at Stanford. And like that just like suddenly like, you know, took that away from like so much of the, the kind of power that I was giving it, like went away just by that one statement Dan said that like, oh, I had imposter syndrome. So knowing that like, you know, that kind of like uh, uh, self doubt and all that, like everybody goes through um, uh, was helpful for me. Um, also, another thing is about comparing with like other peers, like which is we we naturally do. And as uh, John was saying about like how uh, it it as much as you enjoy work doing your work, like you always kind of like also are in this situation where everybody else is publishing. And um, I think it's easy to say that like don't do that, but like have I think knowing that these are things everybody face and everybody have these sort of um, uh, issues that they deal with, uh, and we probably would go through some of these things in the questions. Um, what I really recall 
very fondly about in addition to like the mixing of social and i mean having a good social life was working with others so in in in, in comparison to like you know the whole uh, comparison or competition uh, situation i think the weeks like or certain weeks that i have had like this like long sprints with like certain colleagues or peers like for uh, or peer phd students like on a particular exciting project that was like more kind of uh, things that i really remember um uh, my phd life with um uh, they were intellectually stimulating it was interested in i was interested in the topic and so being able to sort of like navigate your phd around like things that you're really passionate about and things that you can work with others uh, and communicating and convincing your advisor to actually sort of like be supportive of that. I, I think I think it's kind of like a communication thing. Like I think if it's, uh, uh, I know that like not every advisor uh, advisee relationship is like you know um, made in heaven, but uh, I think it's I think uh, communication helps a lot in terms of like saying like what you're passionate about and sort of like um, uh, um, sharing that until like no waiting until like things kind of go south um i'm gonna stop talking i feel like i spoke too too much but i look forward to um uh, other questions that are coming through in the chat um uh i will take the first question that um Xi Jing has shared so yeah i think about uh, questions the first question is about time management um about how to manage time uh, especially, I think this is an interesting and important thing. Um, there could always be life events happening in the middle of a PhD. Uh, usually, what percentage of time do supervisors expect PhDs, uh, PhD students, I assume, to work in a highly efficient manner? It is around 60% and then 40% for unexpected life things, non-tech things. Um, so yeah, I think um, maybe uh, 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 Verena or Greg or Steve want to go first as uh, professors? Yeah, sure. So these are two questions, right? That how do you manage time, um, which is a very good question. I still struggle with that. I think someone said before, every time you say yes, you say no to something else. And I think that's something really, really important, which, you know, as me as an academic, I still struggle with that. And I read a book which made that point and that really, really helped me to every time I I want to say yes, I realize I'm not only saying no to other academic things, but I'm also saying no to other things which are important to me, like my family, my friends, my, my health. Um, so, so I think that's something really, really to keep in mind to stop yourself from saying yes to everything. And I think partly our tendency to say yes, I think there are two things. First of all, we want to please people and usually they're not that actually um, bothered if we say no. You always think they are heartbroken, but they just will ask someone else. It's not such a big deal for them. The other thing is that actually you will be asked again. It's not the one of a lifetime chance that you got. Um, you know, I also thought, I, I remember being fresh off my PhD and people asked me to review and I was always, oh my God, I need to say yes, because this is such an amazing opportunity. Um, and, and now, you know, a couple of years in, you realize, gosh, you know, you, you do get asked again and again and again. Um, so I think that's very, very important to keep that in mind. Um, so, so managing time is partly learning to say no. Um, also, I think it's really important to actually schedule things for yourself. Um, so not only schedule work things in your calendar, but make fixed appointments with yourself, with other people, um, because this is really important. You need to build, I always think about it as a solid foundation where you can, you know, gather the strength you need to actually do good research. So you need to have, you know, time to look after yourself, to look after your relationships, to look after your, your health. And um, because these are things, once they're gone, they will really impact your PhD. So you need to sort of look at it as an investment to do a, actually a better job in your PhD and not as, oh, this will take away my attention or my time from this really important bit of research. Um, Again, if you're working towards a deadline of a conference, there's always the next deadline. Even if you miss that one deadline, even if it's ACL, heaven forbid, there is a next ACL next year, there's a NACL, there's whatever, you know, there's not, it's not these things, 
reoccur. It's not that you have to sacrifice your health or your relationships for that, because these are the things which which come first, and then you can do good research. So I think um, booking this into your calendar, making appointments for it, and actually realizing that these are at least as important as a paper deadline, and actually will help you to do better research in the long run, is something which um, you know, I also learned the hard way, <laughs> um, but I think it's it's something I do have learned, and I, I also um, you know try to pass on to my my PhD students. So yeah, so I think that's the first question. Maybe someone else wants to answer the next Thanks. question. Thanks, Verena. Um, Steve or Greg? Uh, Greg, do you want to go? I see you're unmuted. Yeah. So th there's a question about how to balance exploration and exploitation so basically i what i tell my students is that yes it's it's good to do, do everything at once in in a sense that means do not focus on on just uh, doing experiments all the time or just write reading papers all the time uh, but do it as a kind of switch between those tasks because that refreshes do some experiments, but also keep up with the literature and also spend time writing because even if there is no deadline, uh, th the purpose of this is to write, write it down and at some point you will write it down. And as you write about what you have done, you get new ideas about what experiments to do. And uh, in terms of the keeping up with the all the papers that are being published i think uh it's impossible to keep up with all papers especially if you j start looking at archive but what i advise my students is every time there's a major conference like acl or emnlp to look immediately at the list of published papers from that conference and search for the keywords that you're interested in and check those papers out. That doesn't mean you have to read them all, but at least be aware what's being done by reading the abstracts and scanning the papers. If uh, if something is on an archive, the the chances that it will be eventually published at a top conference, and you may get it a few months to later, but that's a kind of a good trade-off because when it's published at the conference, you are you have a guarantee that it's a, it's a good quality publication. That's true. Thanks, Greg. Um, Steve, do you want to answer this question or like go back to the previous question about like time management or how to deal with like life events? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about the time management, life event stuff. I mean. Um, I think Verena made really good points already about time management strategies. And I think, yeah, having some kind of system is important uh, just for what works for yourself, whether it's making like blocks on your calendar for different times when you'll do different things or just lists that you keep. Um, and then I think an important thing to go with that is to also um, update what you actually did based on what you thought you would do. Um, I feel like that helped me learn to do time management better is reflecting on uh, my past schedules and to-do lists and seeing like, okay, I thought I was going to get 20 things done, but I got like five things done that day. So maybe in the future, I should only plan on five things um, and then I won't overcommit myself. And um, so whatever system you have of planning forward, you can look back on as well and reflect. And then maybe as you go through the PhD, you'll get more accurate estimates um, and you I think that just helps in a lot of ways. You won't overcommit yourself either and say like, oh yeah, I can add these extra things. You'll see your five things and you know you can do five things. So if someone asks you to do six, you just say, I don't have time, maybe another week or something. Um, so yeah, I, I think you kind of learn as you go, but if you keep doing that and reflecting, it's helpful. In terms of life events, I mean, I maybe I'm just really lucky, but all of the advisors or supervisors I've had have been super understanding of anything like that. They're all people too and have probably had a lot of life events themselves that 
um, maybe needed a lot of extra attention at certain times. Um, I think, I don't know if I can give a sp specific percentage of like how often people expect you to be super productive, but I think maybe this isn't as satisfying, but I would just say the key is having clear communication with uh, the people you're working with so that they know like what's going on. Um, all you can do is your best with the situation that you have and you have to take care of the things that are important to you. Um, and it's not the end of the world if you need to take a leave of absence or if you need to even quit the PhD, like um, for whatever happens. I, I mean, if you think about, um, I don't know, like the worst that could happen in terms of your PhD, um, it's usually something you can recover from. Um, I'm talking about the work side. Um, the life event is something else, but um, your PhD is just a, uh, it's really cool thing and it's a big deal, but it's also kind of, it's, it's a job and uh, there are more important things. So, and I think academics in general understand that. Thanks, Steve. Um, now, I mean, uh, as a current PhD student, John, like, do you wanna add? Uh, maybe how do you do uh, this? And maybe you have also experience like either firsthand or like through other people's experiences of like how things have worked out or not worked out. Sure, and time management, what's worked and what hasn't worked? Yeah. In particular, sure. And I apologize if you get the, you got the Caltrain somewhere behind me, if you're hearing that. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, time management, I feel like is tricky because you can work for, you know, two months on a project, uh, 40 hours a week and get nothing done. And you can also um, take a week uh, vacation and then come back and have the idea that that turns into a nice paper, right? Like the, you know, uh, the PhD is, yes, it's a job, but it's an interestingly um, uh, kind of bursty I think job in terms of like where work gets done and what does work getting done mean and you know there are definitely aspects of the job that are very regular like okay if you're teaching you have expectations and it's I think it's difficult when life events happen there to um, uh, you know you need you need an advisor you need a professor who's going to be understanding just like you would in other jobs but I've found uh, you know for example um, uh, during the pandemic, I had a really, really hard time and I was not productive and the pandemic is of course still happening, but especially in the first, um, let's say half year or something. I mean, it's a life event we all had in some sense. Um, and I was, I think, very privileged in, in, in how I sort of had an easy, like a, not a ton of responsibilities on me as a person. And yet I still sort of did really badly. I couldn't. I couldn't get much work done. And and so what? What was to be done there? Well, my advisors sort of had to handle it. They weren't going to, you know, <laughs> fire me at the time. Um, but they were understanding. And then, you know, I had and thinking back on it, and how did I manage my time? Well, I tried to work, right? And I tried to spend hours, and I sort of got nothing done while it was while I was working. Um, and so at that point, I, I really did just have to have kind of a reset in my head, like, okay, well, this isn't working. Like I'm trying to work some amount of hours and sort of the, I'm sitting at a table and I'm looking at a laptop, <laughs> but, but work in the PhD sense is not happening. Like creative ideas aren't coming and progress on papers aren't, isn't coming. Um, and that was a wake up call for me saying I had to spend more time doing just anything else and just taking a little bit of time off. And I found the PhD in my context, at least to be quite amenable to that, right? So I could, you know, if I didn't work for a week, I could, you know, show up to my advisor meeting and be like, well, you know, I spent this week kind of figuring out stuff for myself. And they thankfully were, were, were okay with that. And then if the next week you get some exciting idea, well, that might be even better than if you had worked, you know, more. So, so I think that there are, great opportunities, even though the PhD is, is long and a lot of work, um, the fact that the deadlines, as has been already stated, are so sort of many and there's always the next deadline and um, much of the time you're, you're I think, uh, lucky in that no one's waiting on you to do something in the next 30 minutes all the time, right? Like for, the, for, for all of your time, um, 
I found it very useful to just like take advantage of the fact that like, hey, if I don't want to work on Tuesday because I tried and I'm feeling awful or some others, you know, in the context of the pandemic, you can just kind of not. <laughs> and, and I was very thankful for that uh, ability. Thanks. Thanks, John. I mean, I, I resonate a lot with uh, what you just said. Um, uh, I, I don't remember having any uh, major life events during my PhD, but um, uh, I think I've always found uh, research to be a very bursty activity. Like, so I would be like super productive, like, like, I don't know how many hours I spend, like I'll be super productive for like three, four months, like I'll be on a roll, like, you know, make a lot of progress, but then there'll be like a few months that like nothing happens. And I felt okay with it. And I think uh, during my grad school, like I was, I was not, kind of like penalized for it. Um, uh, but, um, and that, I think that freedom or that that kind of flexibility was really helpful. And that's a time that you usually, I usually go visit my family in India or like something like that. So then th that's not like the time when I end up like, it's not necessarily aligned with like summer or anything. And so uh, it's kind of some, sometimes it doesn't really align. So it, I think it goes back to something that you mentioned about like your uh, it, first, I think it depends a lot on like you as a person, whether you are someone who is more kind of disciplined. I mean, I, I don't want to kind of find myself uh, super disciplined. Um, so I take it with a grain of salt, anything I say. Um, so if you are someone who like works with a lot more structure to your life, and then I think, you know, having more planned uh, kind of uh, activities like health, um, I think having some flexibility also helps, like if, if it depends on like the person, but also like your advisor and how much flexible they are and like uh, that relationship and communication also uh, matters. Um, this takes me to sort of um, uh, the, another set of questions that we, are, we have. Thank you, Zhijing, for like, so uh, on the fly, like categorizing and grouping questions and having it handed over to me like such a nice way. Um, so I think it's uh, slightly switching topics into like more, th more than time management. I think we kind of talked about uh, some of this is about uh, stress management, right? How do you handle burnout and avoid burnout in the future? I think some of it comes from like managing time. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, um, life events similar to, I mean, I think uh, in this question, uh, someone is like kind of illicit, uh, explicitly calling out like certain life events such as like passage of um, uh, family members, uh, marriage, um, babies, uh, and other major changes. Um, and so these kind of things, uh, how does like the stress that get induced by like um, uh, these things as well as like, you know, uh, things in career, uh, you know, how do you manage that? So uh, do anyone wanna uh, add uh, to it things that are not discussed and part of like the time management and then we can move on to the next question. Okay, I'm gonna call out. Uh, Verena, do you wanna say? <laughs> yeah, sure. So I think I think this is a really important question about, you know, what, what happens if life happens basically? Because from my observation, usually when someone comes and does a PhD, they're usually all smart enough to, you know, complete their PhD and publish papers. However, the main challenge is when, you know, these big life events happen. And, you know, this is unfortunately by random, you can't control these things. Um, you know, there are breakups, um, there are um, health issues. Um, so, so this is just an inherent unfairness which you know you have to pay attention to and will drag your attention away and, and, and your attention has to be dragged away you can't just ignore these things you have to deal with them um so i think here is really important that you talk to especially your advisor and your super or your supervisor and in britain you call them supervisor um because it's important to still think about how you can re basically how you can make the time without you know you panicking <laughs> so um one thing you know when that happens what I'm, what I'm trying to do with my students is like what's what's a minimal viable option so okay you take the time off you'll be away for a couple of months um there are regulations in, in the UK which allow you to do that there's a temporary suspension of study or you've got mitigating circumstances and so on and so on um but I think there still needs to be some reassurance for the student that 
I can somehow continue my PhD because otherwise there's an additional, you know, stressor in their life, which they can't really use at this stage. So I think as a supervisor, you have the responsibility to, to come up with a plan B. I know, okay, maybe it, it won't be the full series of experiments which we have planned, but okay, let's do this minimal viable version. And then it's still a good story and maybe change that story a little bit to not include this aspect. So I think this is something, you know, you, you, the responsibility partly, you know, belongs to your supervisor because they should have the, the oversight of what, what constitutes a PhD thesis. Um, and that doesn't often have to be, you know, 10 and 20 of papers or published. Sometimes it's enough to have a good story, which, you know, is coherent. Um, and, and that's something which I think you can contribute as a supervisor and just reassure them that, okay, you go away, you sort your life out um, and, you know, I'll be here waiting for you and we, we get you through on the other end. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Greg or Steve? Yes, so so uh, definitely the the events happen, and uh, it's it's sometimes good to take a time off and uh, and devote yourself to solving the problem, and come back uh, to do your PhD. Uh, if you if you do the paperwork, then it uh, you get that extra time afterwards, so you don't lose that time. You still have enough time to do a PhD. Uh, and another thing that I, I wanted to mention, which is slightly different, uh, but is a question that uh, uh, PhD students very often ask, is how do I find a topic for my thesis, right? This is, this is a big thing that you cannot just order one on Amazon. Yeah. And, uh, and um, I'd like to maybe give some kind of uh, advice on that is, uh, what I find useful is to find some kind something in uh, in real life that you find interesting uh, like have interest travel around is good and that gives you an ideas so to give you some concrete examples for example I, I uh, studied Latin which has nothing to do with computer science but that gave me an idea you know I in Latin you have to memorize all these conjugation and stuff how about we write a program that does it, right? And and that kind of put me on on some kind of research project. And also, I, I saw that some some words are similar between languages. Can we write a program that detects those, that finds those uh, similar words? Uh, another thing was I I uh, was reading on uh, on a tablet uh, in a foreign language. And uh, there is this option that you can click on a word and it will tell you what it means. And I noticed that often it tells me what it means, but it gives me all these different senses of the words. And only one is actually applicable. So I thought, well, why not have it like a program that automatically tells you what what is the sense of that word that you're trying to find? And uh, it doesn't mean, you know, once you kind of start exploring, you will see that people had these ideas before and they have done good job on it but this will kind of get you into some area that uh, that you will find other tasks and other things that can be done and eventually you'll get to the point where you see when you ask yourself well I'm reading this paper I'm wondering why they didn't they try this right and this is a, a, a sign that this is an idea that should be tried and although most ideas don't work, eventually uh, some of these ideas will work and you will be able to produce some kind of interesting research. So this is basically some kind of set of uh, ideas how to, how to get to that point where you can actually complete your dissertation. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, that's actually uh latching on to something that actually you personally identify with personally uh, uh, kind of connect with is like really uh, you very, very helpful to sort of like keep going. Uh, uh, Steve, uh, do you want to add any thoughts on to this topic? John? Uh, 
Sure. Yeah, you, you mentioned burnout a little bit um, and how to deal with that. So maybe I'll just say a little bit about it, which I don't think I did perfectly either. But um, uh, Vinod, you talked about like having a social life outside of uh, the PhD. I think that's part of it. And uh, whether it's, well, maybe not even necessarily social life, but some kind of other outside hobbies or thing you do that your whole identity and everything doesn't get wrapped up in your research because it's easy to do that when you're spending so much time and you're introducing yourself as a researcher and everything and then when you do get to those months of slow period or something then it feels like your everything is slow and like your whole life is but if you have other things going on um, and you have kind of a full life and that can kind of sustain you through difficult periods I think that's really important um, and have a variety of things going on. And even things like, um, I know we haven't been able to as much recently, but like with conferences and travel and things like that, I always find that it's like a huge boost to when I start to feel like I'm running out of steam or something. And then you go to a conference and you talk to people and you hear all these new ideas and what they're working on and get yeah. feedback. And you find that people are actually interested in that thing you've been just talking to like your own lab about for the last year and, and you're finding all these people are asking new questions and you get a lot of new ideas and directions and um, yeah I usually find after that I'm super excited to go back to work and try out new things and um, having things like that interspersed through um, your timeline I think is really important to kind of recharge you and energize you so that you're not just doing the research I mean, the research does take most of your time and, you know, like working on stuff, but to make sure that's not all you do for years on end and like hopefully you have the chance to, um, whether it's conference or even just like having different people visit the lab or maybe you give a guest talk somewhere else or just, uh, I don't know, having these extra interactions and things really help like from the research side. Um, yeah. That's, those things I think definitely help with burnout, uh, but it, it's still tough. And then, yeah, like um, making sure to like take care of yourself, uh, thinking of your mental health and like reflecting on that. And there are times even like physical health as well. Like it's easy to neglect some of these things, especially like by a paper deadline or something like that. Um, but just uh, even if you have to like set reminders, make sure to like check in, make sure you're doing okay. Um, a lot of universities have programs that are helpful for this too, like where you can even get like uh, like free counseling or therapy or uh, gym memberships or all kinds of things. So like take advantage of those kinds of things too. It all, it all works together, I think, you know, to uh, keep you going. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Steve. Like I, I resonate with everything uh, you said. I also have like drawn a lot of, uh, energy from my social circle um i mean there usually is like some i mean i think a lot more of my cheerleaders were there as in like when you're working in the in the uh, lab like you're everybody's like working on similar things and like there's a lot going on whereas like it's i think the my social circle kind of like reminded me like oh i am at this place which is like great and like you know i am in a phd position which is great like so those kind of things that you forget once you're in that space um uh, so it's usually like the social circle kind of reminds you like uh like you know a lot of things that you actually kind of take for granted um so i want to move on to uh john uh to hear from john uh on this perspective but also john if you could just sort of like there's like another question that is uh coming up is in terms of um interaction so basically uh what are some good strategies to interact with instead of like say hands-off professors versus um uh, had more of a hands-on professors. I don't know if like you have experiences with like both kinds, but like that, it goes back to the point about like an advisors being, uh, it, depending on the advisor. Um, I also want to be mindful about the fact that we only have three minutes, so we can just like continue this uh, conversation. Uh, not three, seven minutes. Um, uh, like I'll hear from uh, others as well. Uh, but uh, about like the points about like choosing a. a PhD research topic and uh, some of these questions that are on the chat, uh, there have been like other sessions focused, uh, other mentorship sessions focused entirely on it. So there is a YouTube channel that you can, uh, this is for the participants. Uh, you can check it out. Like for, I think there was a specific YouTube channel focused on, sorry, specific uh, session focused on how to choose an MLP topic. Right, Jijing? 
yeah, so I think uh, definitely check them out in addition to uh, whatever we are discussing here. So John, uh, do you want to take it away? Certainly. So briefly on burnout, um, the only thing that I would add to this is um, if that's where you are, that's okay. And if you're, I mean, it's hopefully you we won't stay there and you'll spend time and, 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 and effort moving yourself in a healthier direction. Um, but, you know, don't be stressed about or try your best not to be too hard on yourself for being burned out. Like, oh, I did such a bad job of managing my, my time or mental health that now I'm in a bad place. Um, it happens to a ton of PhD students. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, um, it's okay to be there and, and, and accept that and, and hopefully then start to work towards something, something healthier. Um, uh, Yes. So, sorry, what was the, I kind of got wrapped up in that. What was the next thing you wanted me to talk about? Um, no, no, the other point is, I mean, uh, was about like sort of, I don't know if there's like enough time to like go through like it uh, in depth. Maybe we should just like take it on like to the gather town because it's like a completely sort of like a new question about like how to manage conversations with like sort of in uh, sort of more of a hands-on professor with a hands-off professor but given that we only have five minutes you can discuss that if you have like any specific thoughts but also like any part i would love to give all four of you like any parting thoughts like maybe a one minute each uh, that might be more appropriate right now certainly um yes well anyone who's watching this now or in the future uh please feel free to reach out to me um that's my parting thought i'll i'll let the um the other speakers have the rest of the time. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, uh, Greg? Yeah, so, so regarding burnout, just uh, very briefly, some advice is, uh, and some of this has been already stated, but uh, I go to the gym, uh, like a workout that really helps to kind of load off the stuff from your brain but also going to conferences is very useful uh, but also just vacations traveling with friends that's also going to help a lot and uh, finally social life is very important uh, there's plenty of opportunities when you're uh, in a grad school uh, so so all, all the all this should be uh, taken advantage of and um, um, yeah, I think if you, if you do all this, then uh, oh, one final thing is like allow yourself to do something silly that you enjoy, right? After you finish your day, just make sure that you know watch YouTube or play some games, and don't feel guilty about doing something that is not necessarily very intelligent. So these these are the the main points. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Verena, do you mind? Thanks. Yeah, Sorry, um, sure. Yeah, so I, I think for me, um, there are a lot of really, really interesting um, thoughts in the session. And um, one thing I take away from it, I think everybody struggles at some point during grad school, and it's just something we need to normalize, and people you know, shouldn't feel bad about being burned out, about investing too much or too little time. Um, I think we just need to cultivate a culture of being kind to yourself to normalize these things. Um, and also realizing that there is a difference between thriving and surviving. Ideally, you know, you should be thriving in your PhD, which also means, you know, you build a healthy relationship with your PhD and, you know, treat it ideally like a job and you've got other things in your life going on. So you're not just, you know, your PhD and that will also help you to build up resilience. You know, when that email comes in about rejecting of your dear paper, which you worked on for, for months, then, you know, if you have something else in your life that will help you to get through these difficult times or you're feeling burned out or whatever, so, um, so I think, you know, we, we need to learn that this is not wasted time, um, which you don't spend on your PhD, but this is, this is healthy time and, and even allowing yourself to do absolutely nothing needs to be valued more um, during your PhD and in general in our society. <laughs> Thank you so much, Verena. Uh, uh, 
uh, Steve? Uh, yeah, I would just say um, with all the really good advice out there, it's important to like know yourself and what works for you and individualize and personalize things because everyone's experience will be a bit different. So um, I think it's also really good to reflect when you have all these uh, pieces of advice you're thinking about, reflect on yourself, you know, like what motivates you? Um, do you like pressure? Do you not work well under pressure? Uh, what do you really want to get out of the PhD and how that might be different from others? And um, uh, answering some of these kind of questions really help to make sure you can tailor the experience to make it what you want and, you know, be proactive and, and um, talk with people and set clear expectations about that. I think it's helpful. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you so much, Steve. Thanks everyone for the wonderful, wonderful uh, points. I don't have anything else to add other than basically reiterating what uh, John said earlier. If you are having a tough time, it's okay. It's okay to be there. We all have like moments where we have had tough times and it's uh, fine. You'll get through that um, and reach out to like your support structure uh, that's there, uh, hopefully. Um, and with that, I will conclude uh, this particular session and there is